I first opened that store, there was a guy that pulled up in a 1967 station wagon and he wanted to get some windows tinted. And I thought, ah, oh, I'm not going to do this piece of junk. Forget this. Come to find out this dude owns the newspaper in Thousand Oaks. So it's called the Eggcorn. And he needed people to deliver it at nighttime, early in the morning. I need to supplement my income. So I took on one of his routes. This dude's a friggin' multi-millionaire. So rich. Sent me so many customers. Got me Neil Diamond's house in Hidden Hills. So many customers off just me and that guy. So don't ever judge a book by its cover. You don't know who you're talking to, but this dude knew everybody. And I mean everybody. Hi there. Welcome to Born to Tim with the Miller Brothers. I'm Ricky, and I'm thrilled to be here with my brother, co-host, Josh. Get ready for Engaging Ride as we share trade secrets, business tips, and stories from the window tin industry. Today, we have a very special guest, our father, Richard Miller. Hello. First question I want to get, uh, ask is, I've heard the story probably a million times, but how did you find out about tin? What got you into tin? What was the, the first initial push to all of a sudden go, I'm, I'm going to try this out? Um, in high school, I was into designing wood, and I got into a cabinet shop, and my buddies opened up their first small little tent shop in a storage facility. That storage facility, they were just about out of money, and their yellow page ad came out. And they got really busy, but I built up their storage facility first. But then when they got busy, they could afford a new store, and I built it completely out. And the first week they were there, they made $4,500. And I said, see you guys later. That's what started me. I started, I started tinning windows in my garage to start. That's the first thing I did in November of 83. I was tinning windows right out of the garage. Then we went from there to a store. Before you go any further with that. All right. So, so the next question I'm going to have then is the experience of the first role you bought and the first vehicle you attempted to do, because obviously you just saw them playing around with this film. Did you, how did you even, where'd you learn it from? Cause now self-taught I got a, my roommate that I was living in the garage with had a 240 Z. And uh, my buddies were telling me that all the windows on the sides went into one piece, but they didn't. Normally, they would be pieced. Um, I took a day and a half to tint that car and a roll and a half of film by the time I finished it. So you didn't but, go on YouTube? But I, Nope, there was no YouTube. <laughs> but I got the windows in one piece, and they were blown away because I did it without anyone helping me do it. But, you know, I... I was a perfectionist when it comes to doing things, so I figured it out one way or another. It was hard knocks learning, but I learned. And, but I thought I knew things about business that I had no idea what I was talking about when it comes to running a business. I could tint, but I had no idea that if you made $1,000 that day, doesn't mean you made $1,000. All right, so but backtracking real quick, because that was first for all learning first sight of tint itself so i know high school you were a uh, um, top tier wrestler and you were more than likely going to be getting a scholarship to go wrestle so what what was the um why no college why straight into um or not straight into tinting, but why into just straight into having to make money and then all of a sudden coming across tinting? good question and the thing was the way i was brought up was just to get a job and work hard Reality is I did have a full scholarship to Cal Poly, but I didn't go to it. I started my business instead because my buddies started theirs. We all went to school together. We graduated in June, and they were in business over the summer, and then they started making money, so we switched and opened a store, and I helped them build out that store. As soon as they started making money, I went straight to my first shop and purchased it, opened it and got started with my wife. We were single with a baby on the way. So hi, that would be Josh. <laughs> and uh, my boys have been in this industry since they were little kids. They pretty much been titting since they were 10. So that's actually interesting. That kind of, uh, 
I've always thought the timeline was a little different. So you actually got into tent in November of 83. Right. So that was before I was even, before mom was even pregnant. So you were already into it and then she got pregnant and then it was kind of like. No, she was pregnant in 83. She graduated. She couldn't have been. You were born in October. Yeah. That's 10 months into 84. So. Yeah. Maybe a month later. Yeah. So yeah. But almost immediately after getting into it, then you guys found out you were pregnant. Yeah. Okay. I thought it was. You found out you were pregnant, and then you decided. No, no, no. That, that would be even wilder. Okay. I was into it a little bit before that. Okay. All right. So Back then, it was a secret just to where you could buy the film. What was your first role of film? Um, Deposition Technology, which is Solar Guard now. Um, DTI, right? DTI, Deposition Technology. Uh, a roll of 5% and a roll of 20%. I bought two rolls. How was it working with that material back then? It was fine. It went on. There was no such thing as shrinking windows at the time. You didn't learn to shrink windows until about 87, 88. Which business was that? Because what, what, what was the first, first store name opened? Solar Shops. I named it that because I figured it would be simple. My buddies opened up a shop called Solar Tint. So my first store I opened was Solar Shops. All right, so, yeah, that's it. I have a photo here of three trucks, three Toyotas. Um, we were rummaging through a bunch of different photos. Yeah. And um, is this, would this be technically your first fleet of vehicles? Yep, it is. That's my first store right there, too. Exactly. Me and my buddies. One, that truck right there on the left is mine. Another one on the right is my buddy, Steve, who started with me at the time. Yeah, that's where we tended our first cars. Dude, a, a Nissan truck extra cab. There's a picture of it there somewhere. No, I definitely have it. And then uh, we came across this gem. Um, you, it uh, looks like a uh, Bronco or Blazer. I'm not going to know any better which one it is. But wow, what? what yeah, that's a Blazer. I just touched out the back windows on that. Yeah, that was done right after the Nissan truck. Exactly. Well, well then one of the other things I, I've, I've been curious, I've been thinking about, that, like, just things that, because, I mean, I got, like you said, I, I've been tending technically, I've been in the shop since I was a baby. Yeah. And then started working when I was started about with 10 years old. That's why I wanted that motorcycle. Um, you told me, well, you want it, buy it, and get to work, which probably the best lesson I ever was ever told. And um, I, I thank God for that. Um, with that, though, when did you find out that, or when did you realize that you were good at what you did? And like, how long into tinning did you realize that you were good at it and, um, you know, perfecting it in the way that you could, I guess, back then? Well, I opened my store in Agora Hills, California, which is like where all the rich people live. And I thought that'd be a place to open up. Mm-hmm. Better off opening with the most common people, not the rich people, because they want everything for free. But I got some really good clientele with those rich people. So I tended really high-end cars. That's where I got my, my uh, clientele built up. Back then, you couldn't put every back window on one piece. You had, to sh- you had to cut them line by line, six or seven pieces. So you had to cut right on the defroster line and make it perfect so where they couldn't see the seam. So that's why I, I got so many good clientele. But I eventually learned to do one piece. And when I came to Nevada, there was nobody in Nevada that could do one piece windows. No one. Before we jump into Nevada, all right, so one piece and shrinking. So obviously it was wet shrinking to begin with. All wet shrinking. When did you learn that and how did that come about? Because um, I know, because I'm like, like you just said, I, I've heard that the, when you first came here to Nevada, no one was doing one piece. People would say that couldn't be done, and then you would pretty much say, what do you want to bet? Do it. So coming from California to here, when did, um, before you did that, obviously, when did you learn shrinking? Like, when did you learn? I learned shrinking around 1988-89, and a guy called me up and told me that he could put a 1957 back window on one piece, and I said, that's impossible. He says, I'll show you for 1200 bucks," And I said, well, come on down. So I put a bunch of tinners in an office behind tin, and I charged them all 200 bucks each to learn. And we learned. 
and it went into one piece with no problem. And once I learned the method, I had it down. But the biggest thing was is going from California to Nevada. I, first time I came here, I stopped off at the tent lady, which which had been here back in the day in the 80s and 90s. And they were doing a Corvette back window, and the guy was piecing. I go, why don't you put that in one piece? He goes, oh, you can't. And the and the guy goes, I'll bet you a thousand dollars. And the owner goes, Are you sure you can't do it? I go, I got the film in my car. I'll pull it in here. I'll do it for you right now. One piece, thousand bucks. I'll teach you right now. So I went and got it. The guy busted out his thousand dollars, and I tinted his back window in one piece. No, that's now. Obviously, you're doing it in one piece like that. I'm assuming the other tinners that were there are intrigued. That obviously, they learned how to do it off that. Do you regret doing it in front of them? No, I didn't care. doesn't matter because the reality was is no one in Nevada even heard about it. A couple of them had an idea. They heard it through the grapevine, but they never seen it. The long story, that no one, the story that no one knows about all of a sudden they finally see it. Yeah. Um, Pre-internet. It's kind of wild how lucky we are nowadays that anybody yeah. discovers a new tip or trick. Plus, to do they, it. it's on back YouTube. Then, back then, everyone day. was hiding everything they learned. Today, people share what they learn. You educate each other. It just makes the whole industry better. The difference from that time till now, um, marketing back then. I know that just listen to you talk about it now. You just it sounds like common sense, but you you did a lot of things that to me now just seem like of course. Like you went to a nice area because you figured you'd get nice clients. Um, what was your main way of marketing back there? You already mentioned the yellow page thing. How long did that work for, and what else were you doing at the time? Yellow pages work? was huge then, and then money money mailer. They had the coupons that went out. You get their packets. That was big. That's where you got a lot of your customers. So in California, it's illegal to tint the front doors. So what we did was we put a coupon out. It says we'll tint any car for one hundred dollars but it doesn't include the front doors because that's illegal. So we tell the customer that. If you want your front doors on, that's illegal. We can't do your front doors. Because in California, the the prosecutors for Ventura and L.A. were prosecuting tint shops for tinting their front doors. So you so you couldn't advertise that you tint front doors. So that was a new law at some point, right? And you actually know people that went out of business from getting prosecuted, right? Yeah, like 125000 bucks they got charged, fined. But, but what it was is back then, we, we would put a sticker on every single car. It said what your shop was. Well, one of my friends was putting his on all of them. So the cops were writing down the sticker number and who did it and when they gave the ticket out. And they had, there was, he couldn't get out of it. So they made him either move from Venture to L.A. County or pay 125000 They gave him a ch- choice. So he literally went to Agora after we went to Agora because Agora is L.A., but it's close to Ventura. It's just one block over. Okay, so here's another question I've got. Most people's journey into the tent world starts automotive, especially back then. When did you realize you could tent homes and buildings? When we took our building over and our upstairs windows were three feet wide by 10 feet tall, and it was so hot in there. It was unbelievable. Now, was there a specific film for that back then, or were you just using your automotive we, film? No, we used solar bronze, a commercial film, just a bronze reflective film. It matched the center. We ended up doing a ton of the windows in the center. That's one of our biggest clients was where we at our store. And so, yeah, that, that, was, that ties into the question I wanted to go with. I know a solar shop was first. After solar shop, what did it go to? And that was going to be the next time. Well, those. back then, we started in the 80s, at 83, 84. By the time 1990 came around and we had the Gulf War, that really crunched the economy. People were scared. So people stopped spending money for a while. So what we did is um, we had three stores at the time. We had one in Simi Valley, one in Agoura Hills, and one in Thousand Oaks. So what we did is we crunched down to one store and did a mobile service. We called it California Mobile Window Tinting. That's what we did. And that's where we got into driving around to people. So I had um, 
about five or six vans with two guys in each van going out and taking cars all day. So those vans, I'd make every guy purchase the film from me. So if they were stealing and adding windows, they were stealing their own film. Because the problem with this industry is you make too much money and people get greedy. And to get loyal employees that work for you that show up on time is really hard to get. But we've been lucky. We have very loyal employees. So this, I would assume these, the next two photos are... uh, and the other ones I came across was California window tinting specialists. Yeah, mobile window tinting specialists. Uh, so these bring back some memories. Let me see. Yeah. see. That's my first California mobile van. That's my store on LA Avenue in, in Simi Valley. Yeah, I recognize that one. I yeah. actually have some memories from, from that shop a little bit. There's, yeah. Isn't there a picture of somewhere of me like in a walker in that shop? No, yours is a Gore Hills, the walker. Oh, really? I got that's that picture. one. I do vaguely remember, though. So we moved you out. You were cleaning my wheels on my... You were in the shop on your walker. I remember. We that that shop, I remember I was able to play oh, yeah. with... You were older. ...film yeah. Oh, yeah. on the window and, like, carve my name out with an Ofa blade. And, like, we moved here. I was seven. So I had to be younger than seven, and you were letting me oh, play... Yeah. With yeah. film and an Ofa blade. I mean, you were in the shop by, <laughs> when you were two years old, Josh. I know. It's so wild now as a dad, though, to think about people, that with my kids. You and can't like, afford to pay to have your kids watched and run your business. That's so literally impossible. Uh, I don't know when I'm going to hand uh, uh, Ofa over to Luca. Yeah, but he's Not, ready. Um, uh, sure. No, he thinks he's ready. He keeps asking me constantly when I have, because I already have, already have pictures with him, a pouch on and everything. Yeah. And he keeps asking me, Daddy, I want, I want a blade. I'm like, no. Nah. Not, what not I re- yet, man. What I remember most from all that, even up to this point, was your mother didn't want to be in the industry. She just wanted to get a normal everyday job. But I kept pushing it and pushing it and pushing it. It took us 10 to 15 years before we started becoming very successful. It was a while. But uh, the reality was is. If it wasn't for your mom, we would have never made it. She went to work and worked for Vons and kept us afloat while we were running the store and keeping the store going. It's not something that happens easy. Oh, that easily leads into the, one of the questions I definitely wanted to ask is, how, how in the hell did you do it? Because, like, how with what, what we deal with right now, like, I have a, a very solid team around me. Right. Uh, with, with, uh, with how we operate now. And I, I just think... How could uh, how would this be manageable without, say, either drinking a bottle a night or who knows what? With if I had to support both support my family and then also try to get a business from the ground up, let alone break into the business uh, industry that technically was almost kind of really nothing in the eighties. There really, I mean, there was a couple started. big shops in California in the valley, and that was it. That's how we learned how to tint. We went over there and watched some tint. And it's called solar control. And we watched them tint windows. We had a truck, a back window done. We watched them do it. That's how we learned. All three of us did. But uh, in the in the store itself, all I thought was my rent was eleven hundred dollars on my first store, and I had a one bedroom townhome that was six hundred. So I figured I only had to make 1700 a month. But I knew nothing about business when it comes to telephones, yellow page ads, gas, insurance, all the other stuff. This, this, this is exactly why I wanted to have, well, we, we wanted to have you on as a first guest, is uh, the lessons that have been learned over 40 years are hard like Ricky was saying, it's kind of hard to even imagine being at that point. Somewhere out there right now, there's somebody that's just starting their young person well, right out of school. When we moved from California to Nevada, we had one of our best years in California. I almost didn't leave. Um, it was right during the Gulf War, right after it, and I had an account with Lockheed in the Valley. And I started doing a couple of employee cars. And every day I'd have four or five cars there waiting to be done. So we just kept going and going and going. So then I just moved to Nevada because I knew people in Nevada weren't being fined because it was legal to tint front doors here. 
And I figure as hot as it is, people are going to have to tint their cars. So we moved here. But the difference between California and Nevada is night and day when it comes to window tinting for cars and stuff like that. Yeah, no, I I, I don't know. Just the, the what I was asking is um, just looking back on it now and being so grateful to be in the position that we're in now and that we actually grew up through that because... I've got a ton of memories of weekends, summers at the shop. Like we also got to play a ton of sports and stuff. And I don't even know how that was managed to get wrangled into that. But like not knowing anything and having to learn it on the fly, barely being able to pay bills and, and all of that. Um, I don't know. It's just like the more I think back on it and like really try to put myself in your position back. Then. It was long hours. Yeah. I would be, I wouldn't be home before nine o'clock. So it was tenacity and grit and like, the fact that we got to learn that from seeing it, not being preached at about it. Oh, absolutely. And like now later in life, we found people like David Goggins or Cameron Haynes or Jocko that are preaching these things. And it's like, oh yeah, we've seen that before. That's what our dad did. Yeah. You know, like you just got to keep going. Um, I don't know. It's just, it's wild. Well, the about. reality is, is back then, I remember when you first tried to get me to pay money for Google, I thought you were nuts. Yeah, I really wish we'd have went all in back then. Yeah, when well, we did go in eventually. <laughs> We're trying to buy. But I mean, people. our best year in California was two hundred ninety thousand dollars. By the time we did Google, and I think it hit for two years, we did Google. We went up to seven hundred thousand. I mean, that's a huge jump. And then from there, it just snowballed. Just time compounding. It's just like every other investment. You put enough time in. So, you were just saying. The, the move from Cali to here, because that was definitely something I wanted to hit on. Like, I, I've heard the story over and over again, or at least snippets of it, and it's just like, it's just kind of common, com, common memory almost. So the, I didn't know the big job. I thought it was more of the um, economic dropout of, of, like you said, the Gulf War is the reason why we pushed here. But the big driver was just climate difference. And then also just laws, then because... We were doing, I mean, how much, how much of the business was cars over flat glass back then? And like, so that was like the biggest driving factor. Uh, was. It was about 50, 50 back then. We had buildings to do. We had some good sized buildings. So, so this actually ties into a question I have. You kind of mentioned Thousand Oaks earlier. And I, I remember hearing the story in the past and just like yesterday, listening to Joe Rogan, talk to Hulk Hogan. He talked about how he owned a home in, a, in Westlake and Thousand Oaks for like 20 years. Um, you've told me that you tended one of his houses. Wh which one was it? Well, Hulk Hogan's house, the one I did, was one of his originals, and it was in the valley on Devonshire and Tropicana, or Topanga, and he lived right next door to one of my biggest clients. And it's basically my biggest client was the adult industry, period. Okay. But these guys walked around with $30,000 in their pockets at all times. So they lived right next door to Hulk Hogan. And I tended his house first. And Hulk Hogan see it, and he had me come over and do his house. That still happens every day. We go tend a house, and we end up back doing most of the yep. neighbors. Oh, that's how we did that. That's the exact story, when we, how we got Mike Tyson's house. We were across the street. Tending another house. Fixing the one window for uh, Mrs. U. Yeah. And as I got on off the scaffolding to tint that window, you came over, and you're like, you're never going to guess whose house I'm going like, Mike Tyson. I'm like, oh, you're full of it. No way. And you're like, I want to show you because the, just the windows and layouts of the house, you want to get my opinion on kind of some ladder work. And then sure enough, walk in, we take a couple steps in and to the left, there is a statue of uh, Mike Tyson. So, and then you hear him in the background. I'm like, oh, he wasn't kidding. That's Mike Tyson. So this is wild because you did Hulk Hogan's house. You were here for Tyson's house. I was in the army at the time. I missed that one. Yeah. And just like a week ago, I got to do Francis Ngannou's house, which like, yeah, like, well, I can't think of three bigger people in all of combat sports. That's kind of wild. Yeah, that is true. I never thought of that. Well, that's that's kind of wild. Yeah. And now Mike Tyson's training you got him. Yeah. Yeah, and the houses Hulk Hogan lived in and those guys lived in, those houses came with tennis courts behind your house. They were like on that three quarters of an acre, all of them. That old neighborhood was like that. So everybody could get your house with your tennis court and everything else. So you got a lot of land with those homes. Those homes were probably about six or seven hundred thousand in the eighties. They're probably like five million now. Oh, probably more than that. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, more than that right now. 
but I mean, I got some huge jobs from those people. The the guys that I used to do business with is off of Devonshire in the Valley. They own like 22 buildings I did for those guys. So this, this actually leads into another question I had because we're very referral rich in our business currently. Like yep. when I look at the numbers, we still to this day, most of our lead generation is more from referrals than anything. It's just looking at it a couple of days ago. So that's a lesson you just kind of learned on the fly. Like. Oh, totally. And it's just to bring that back, how big that customer was. Those guys drove around eight. They had the first 800 series BMW and I tinted those cars for them. Those cars came out with those electric windows that closed and locked after the doors closed. Those were the first ones that did that. So they rolled up an extra inch. So I tinted the whole car with the windows open and we closed the doors and they rolled up. And they, were, <laughs> they were an inch short. Well, come to find out when I moved here, I get a phone call from the Review Journal mansion and I go up there. It's the same guys. They bought that mansion up on Sunrise Hill. They're looking over the whole valley. The whole back of the house had glass roof looking over the valley. It was called the Review Journal Mansion. It was, I remember going on that. With it you. was on like two acres. Same dudes, same owners. It's like did, a greenhouse on the top almost. Yeah. Like all glass. Yep. Yeah, I and remember that. Vividly. We put bronze on it because it was so hot. We tuned that whole thing. But I mean, I get clientele from California still to this day. Oh, yeah. There's no, I, I would say at least five to ten times a year. We'll I'll have someone who comes in who said, I've been doing business with your dad for over 20 plus years, either being from here or the fact I've had one or two customers talk about and bring up see me and it's like the stories that they tell. Yeah, I get them is, saying it's been 40 years now. We actually, we had a customer bring in one of those um, plastic cups. We still have it at the shop. Plastic really? Cup, the California uh, mobile yeah. tent. Really? Yeah, That's that. funny. I should buy it. Yeah. That's crazy. Well, was that just a gimmick giveaway or... We just made them to hand out to people. One thing we did learn while we were there, we used to have an account with Spray Away Glass Cleaner that they would put our logo on the cans. So what I did is I handed out the cans to all the customers because nine times out of 10, a customer will look at your card, but they won't keep it. There's nowhere to keep it. And uh, they always had the glass cleaner. I'm, I'll, I easily got a thousand jobs off those glass cleaners. So we actually, we found a bunch of the older ones and there's been a couple different variations of us doing that over the years. And then we got away from it. And just recently we've gotten back into it. And well, same thing. Now we've got a QR code on there. C.R. Lawrence bought it yeah. out and we couldn't get them made like we used to get no, them. No, you can get them made. They just cost more than what you can buy. Wait, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's this actually. ridiculous yeah. amount of money. The way we're doing it now is pretty cool, though. I don't even know if you've seen it. So we've got QR codes on there generated in TintWiz. And if the person ends up wanting work done, they can scan the QR code and it pulls up a lead form. And we know that it came from the glass cleaner cans. Cool. So it's like Perfect. it's come a long way. Yeah. Well, like the whole the the what was it was the thought of giving the like the fact that giving the glass cleaner away was that just something that you picked up from somebody because like that's literally like almost like Alex from Rosie. It's give, um, give away something for free. Don't expect anything. Here it is. But the fact that you're giving you really away, want to hear the and truth, you, and I'll tell you, this goes back to one of Josh's questions: How did I survive? When I first opened that store, there was a guy that pulled up in a 1967 station wagon. And he wanted to get some windows tinted. And I thought, ah, oh, I'm not going to do this piece of junk. Forget this. Come to find out, this dude owns the newspaper in Thousand Oaks. So it's called the Egg Corn. And he needed people to deliver it at nighttime, early in the morning. I need to supplement my income. So I took on one of his routes. This dude's a friggin' million, multi-millionaire. So rich. Sent me so many customers. Got me Neil Diamond's house. In Hidden Hills, where the Kardashians live, I did his house. I mean, so many customers off just me and that guy. So don't ever judge a book by its cover. Any customer that comes in, you don't know who you're talking to. But this dude knew everybody. And I mean everybody. Oh, no, I would say that's definitely one lesson you have instilled in us is that you don't know what someone can or can't do. I try. And treat everyone exactly the same. And uh, it's definitely something you have, I would say. Yeah. Smashed into our heads, which again, one of those lessons that you slowly or not slowly were teaching us without us really noticing. And that now we look back, or at least I look back, and I know Josh would agree too, 
we look back and like all right all the things that like he's been preaching the whole time is pretty spot on yeah it's pretty wild i was actually telling ricky the other day so one of the things when i was younger teenage boy uh even up into my maybe early, like 1920 one of the things that always would drive me crazy was how uh tidy you were and if we were in the back of the shop like cleaning tinning a car on a busy day and uh you'd walk in and blow your gasket on the fact that there's like trash on the floor and i always thought like we're tinning we're making money like what we don't need to do that right now and uh now that i'm older a little bit wiser and look back on it like customers definitely appreciate seeing people that actually take care of their own stuff and keep stuff clean and in order and uh yeah, so it's a lesson I've eventually learned, and I know I got, gave you a lot of grief for it in the past, but uh, now I'm the one that walks in, and our guys are pretty good about it when we're not around, but there'll be moments where I walk in, and I'm just like, yep. calm down. That, well, <laughs> that started my first store. When I opened up that first store in Agora Hills, I had friends that did tile, and I wanted to use my company colors. We're going to be pink and black. So what I did was is, Inside the store in the front lobby way, I put all black tile and he put pink grout on it, all black granite countertop. I spent money on the shop mm -hmm. that I shouldn't have spent because I was stupid, young and dumb. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, when you walked in that store, it looked like you were in Beverly Hills. My, my store was spotless. Everything was painted, cleaned, everything. But I've been like that, OCD yeah. perfectionist well, my whole friggin' life. Even though I fought it, it's definitely benefited me, and I'm, I'm definitely we, we definitely keep a tidy shop now. And uh, yeah, we have the nicest tin shop in the whole Western United States. I don't care what anyone says. <laughs> uh, the the piggyback off Josh's comments. No, absolutely, I was just as guilty as him that when I was just um, I'd say main installer or just a, just a, an auto installer. And when it came down to it, it would not drive me crazy, but yeah, you, you writing us so much about it. But now that like the, I've gotten to the position I'm in now, it's like, I, it's 100% one of those things where I, I I'm like, I understand it now. And like, that's one of the biggest compliments we get constantly in our reviews is either if it's from the, the auto guys, the, the um, um, customer, when they walk in the experience of walking into the front of the shop, how the shop's put together, Every person I've ever brought into the back of our shop, they say the exact same thing. Like, wow, I, this, this, this place is nice. Mm -hmm. Which it's always awesome hearing that. And then let alone the reviews that we get for homes too. Like the same thing you beat into me and Josh over and over again, not figuratively, not literally, um, beat into us that when you're in someone's home, lay the drop out. Eat. Drop pull, costs pull everywhere. It out, actually lay it out, lay paper towels in the seal, Pick your trash up as you go. Yeah. It's, I don't say majority, but there's a good chunk of people that really, they're just not going to care. And that's fine. It's, it's what they're like, Hey, you're going to clean up. Like you're here to do your job. I don't care. Yeah. But the, the people that do notice that they're the ones that go on and they will mark and they will, they will say like, um, they will tell you like, thank you so much for doing that. I appreciate yep. it. And then let alone shoes coming off. I, I can't tell you how much it, I, at least bugs me now, now that obviously I'm a homeowner, and, you know, I, I try to keep everything as tight. when I say I try, my wife keeps everything pristinely clean. Um, I, I try to assist. But, like, when I have a contractor come over and they just walk straight in, and it's not even just, like, the question of, A, if they have booties on or if they have shoes, like, hey, shoes off or anything. When I go on an estimate or we go on a job, like, it's not even before the customer even tells me, can you? I'm already popping my shoe off. And they're like, oh, my God, thank you. And then, like, that's like how that, the conversation will start there. It's like the last two guys just walk straight in. And it's, like, right there. I already know, like, I am miles ahead of the other person now just because I took my shoes off. You know where I learned it? I was sitting in a house in Malibu for a guy that was the T-shirt maker of all the rock star bands. And he did Michael Jackson. He did The Cure, The Colt, all these. He was a promoter. It's called The Great Southern Company. And his house looked over all of the beach in Malibu. Well, um, I tinted his house, but I covered everything, all his floor area. He had windows that were 10 feet above other 10-foot windows. I had to bring a big, giant ladder in and tin them, and I made sure none of that water ran down his walls. Guess whose house I tinted next, right next door? Madonna's. 
right next door. Madonna and Sean Penn lived right there. Then I tinted uh, the girl from St. Elmo's Fire. Um, the girl, you ever seen the risky business one? Or no, um, what was it called? The guys were Judd Nelson's in it. And he walks away with a bunch of dork kids in class in detention. Oh, it was a 1980s movie. That's Breakfast Club, Breakfast Club? isn't it? Breakfast Club. Breakfast Club. Okay. The girl that had her hair all done, she lived right yeah. next door, too. Molly. Yeah, exactly. No, no, yeah. Is no. It? What are, I think her name was Molly something. Uh, I know you're talking about. Wrong. But I attended her house right. next after that. And then the next one, I said, these are two and a half acre homes that go down. They have all their their pool and all their bars and everything outside. And then the rest goes down to the ocean. You can see the beach right at the end of their homes. Those homes were four and five million dollars in the eighties. Oh, they took million. Yeah, more. easily, if not more. Yeah, you definitely found the right trade with your personality type because one thing I know about the window tint industry now that I've been in it most of my life, um, attention to detail and being meticulous is like the key to it's a clean it. Install, Especially right? in a house like that. I when we did Janet Jackson's house, that was in Calabasas Hills. I ended up getting Gallagher, the comedian's house, off of Janet Jackson. He was a crazy dude. He's nuts. He has all these crazy ideas about the traffic in L.A. <laughs> He's telling me, we need to do just like they do in Europe. If there's an accident on the 101, you just bring up a, a big old snow pusher, <laughs> shove that car off the road, and let's let's get the traffic reopened. Because in Europe, if you get in an accident, your car doesn't stay on the freeway. They don't care who you are. Is scrape it aside. Man, you, we missed out on so much good content. Why didn't you have an iPhone? I know. Well, <laughs> shit, that was back in then, back in the day. Well, no, with the, uh, um, with the, the attention to detail stuff, like the shoes off and all that, like, and then that just l add a little bit more to that. And the fact that like, even when like, I'm, unfortunately I, I'm, I tell you again, this is where I, I know I'm being like you is like, I'll walk into a house that the guys are on a house in there. They set something down like on someone's table or something like that. Right. The stupidest thing for me, but it, it irks me. It's like, they don't put a paper towel underneath it. And it's just like, yeah, just that small little sign, you get the right customer that notices that just like you said, you did the one person's house, you did all that. And from that, that's just spiraled into numerous homes past that because exactly. they went and brag. They're bragging about your tent job, but at the same time, they're also bragging about the fact that, all the small little things had nothing to do with your job, but you were paying attention to those details. So technically in their eyes, they have no reason to like, they're going to go inspect their work, but they have no reason to be on top of you really inspecting much of anything. Cause they like, if he's doing all this, I got nothing to worry about. Yeah. I mean, literally from that one customer I did, I ended up in Chan Jackson's house. Then I ended up in her parents' house and next door, her neighbor next door to Jan Jackson's parents' house was some lady that just did nothing but gossip. All she could do is talk about Michael Jackson and his llamas out there and everything else. But literally, that that was from Calabasas to Ventura area. There was a lot of customers in between there that I did for once I got to know all those people. Yeah. All right, so we've already mentioned a couple times, Cali to Vegas. All right, so you come to Vegas. When... Okay, I think, oh. what inspired Vegas. Green Valley? Well, not just what inspired the name? Okay. Green Valley Tent. Well, like, that was one thing I learned after opening my first store, things in business, from talking to guys that do a lot of business, older, rich dudes in Aurora Hills. Um, when you name your business, you want to locate your business. And by using the town name, they know where you are. It was like if I would have started in Simi, I would have never made solar shops. I would have made Simi Valley window tent or Agora Hills window tent because then they know where you're at. That's why I did it. So we had been here a couple of times for uh, softball. And uh, we had a tournament out at the Silver Bowl. Mm -hmm. And I was asking people where the nice areas are out here. And some of those parents that were playing softball going, oh, Green Valley is a nice area. And this is right when it was first started. Green Valley had just started. But so, I, I, so I know part of that at the time, it was like a new nice area. And it ended up playing a 
big role. We were already into playing baseball and stuff, but I know at the time, Green Valley had a powerhouse for a high school baseball team. Sure. That that played a part, right? No, the no one that I met. There. Yeah, I knew those guys, but I mean, the whole point was just to locate because technically speaking, in order to afford a shop in Green Valley is this criminal. So we our store is technically speaking in Henderson, close to Green Valley. <laughs> Yeah. Well, Green Valley is like a section of Henderson. Yeah. So yeah. But the reason I picked Green Valley was the weather, the heat out here. And um, I wa- when you first move here, looking for a house to live here was hard. We could f- we found we found a realtor that could help us find a place to live because the day we came to look, that, that's when I knew we were coming. It was 121 degrees in the gas station on Rainbow and Spring Mountain. We, I was in that 76 station, and on the wall, he had a thing outside. So that day was probably like 117 on the on the real scale. But uh, it was so hot. I was like, we're moving here for sure because you have to have tin here. <laughs> Supply and demand. Yep. No, that's that's the one thing I heard the most growing up is the main reason why he came out here was I mean, California tint's nice. It looks pretty. Vegas, you have to have that. You're going to burn your car. So yep. One of my favorite stories from the early days, and it involves Ricky. Before we moved here, you had three shops. We were doing pretty decent as far as things go. And uh, we would come out here to vacation, and we would stay at the Mirage. Hell yeah, when just we, opened. When we actually <laughs> made the drive to move, I remember Ricky throwing a fit and being all upset when we pulled up to the house we moved to because it wasn't the Mirage. He thought Las Vegas meant the Mirage. Yeah. Well, <laughs> <any of> <laughs> well the Mirage had just opened, so we've been here a lot in 85, 86. You know, have a good summer, come out and blow some money at the casino. That's how I found Vegas. Fun our, fun our um, schools. Thank you. Yeah. Funding our schools. Um, all right, so beyond Green Valley, what inspired a sunrise and palm trees as our logo? My original guy did my California logo. He's from See Me. His name was Dick Kranzler. He was a, an artist, and all his signs when he first did them were all airbrushed. They weren't vinyl. Mm. So he would airbrush the logos and stuff like that. Then he got into vinyl and airbrushed together. So I took my first van, that gray van you got there. That was the first Green Valley window tint That's van. That's off a windmill in the middle of Green Valley, right around Legacy Golf Course. And there are no houses there, yeah, that was, as you can see. That was giving me my next question. There is absolutely is no at? apartments there. That's on Green Valley Parkway. Wow. All those apartments and everything are up and down that. There is nothing there. That's near Legacy Golf Course. So, what, where, you said Wigwam and Green Valley Parkway or Windmill? Windmill, Green Valley Parkway, just beyond the fountains. There was like yeah, right where the oh, okay. golf course is by. Just past Robin Dillage. Nothing there. Yeah, Robin Dillage. Yeah. yeah. All right. So we went from that and then just we slowly evolved the 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 sunrise and palm trees. But no, but that doesn't so why the palm trees though? Like what's the, what, the what? desert? What are, oh, of course, palm trees in Vegas. Of course, yes. Yeah, of course. You know. <laughs> Come on. Because when, we go, you, know, when you open up the damn mirage, the guy spent six million dollars on his trees around his hotel. So oh, okay, what you're yeah, that makes sense. Is the idea came from the mirage, which you thought we were moving to. Yeah, again. Don't <laughs> <remember>. <laughs> <laughs> oh, jeez. Our logo is still pretty close to that. It's evolved. It is. For sure. we, I had it redone when we wrapped one of our first vehicles, and we went over it and tried to condense it a little and get rid of some of the stuff that was in it. Mm. And then you guys recondensed it again. Uh, so uh, yeah, okay. All right, that's one way of putting it. Uh, yeah. Yes, we condensed it. Yeah. I don't know if necessarily that's, you condensed it because there was like almost like just phrases. Well, and whatever. All the way down. Either way, doesn't and matter. Then, and then, well, that's when when the shell got back into the company. She saw that. I think that was like her first big. Well, the reality was, is, it still like works. It's, oh, it's it's a little different, but the point is, is people know who we are. Oh, okay. That 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 leads me into the next one. 
why orange and green is just because of just the logo itself and then eventually those co colors just dominated because like now like i i can't tell you how many times i hear someone say i saw you because usually i i was driving either an orange van or orange scion uh but uh eight ten years ago that's why i always drove a company vehicle which i still do i still have a wrap and our logo on the back but it's like now it's at a point where we have four four we have four vans uh -huh. like you can go out with crews we have one van that goes out for sales and then we have the sign that's right neon green just to stick out but what made you gravitate towards just orange was it just because it's you're just going to stick out yeah that stuck out and the green was for green valley obviously I assume. but uh the orange you could definitely see when you were coming from wherever so i everything used to be white with logos on it and then i switched to that solid color, which I wanted to brand myself. I learned that from going to the panorama meetings, oh. how to brand yourself. Well, thank you for leading me into my next photo. So this photo I came across, I remember this very vividly. A, it's panorama's first logo when it comes down to it, but it was a convention. I'm pretty sure it was at- uh, and Down by the- Cashman? Cashman Field, it was the Cashman baseball Field. field. Yep. yep, that's one of our original shows. That's their booth. From Panorama. That what? was the first Panorama booth. Yeah. Is that you there? Oh, yeah. Please, please look. That was oh, the one no, where I you ended up this. going into like the ShamWow dudes oh, booth and yeah. selling yep. those. Was the, you got paid, yeah. made money there for other people. <laughs> and there's my, there, those are the early right. glass cleaners right there. Yep, we got one Which of those at the had, shop. We had a customer come in with one of those. Mm. And, and, yeah. and literally it was like, because they saw the new one, they got the new one, we were doing another car for them. And they're like, I still have your original. Do you want me to bring it in? I was like, please bring it in. They brought it in. We have like technically the evolution of those cans. That's cool. We had but no, yeah. There's you. At the booth. Oh yeah, you at the booth. Yeah. Because when I came across these, I was wondering if it was, if I was wondering if it was just me so I remember that very vividly because I remember like being there. I wasn't necessarily bored. I was excited to be there. But then I also vividly remember watching that dude sell those sham wow towels and then like memorizing his sales pitch to like a T and then him asking if I wanted to do it. And I was like, okay, went over there. And the dude's genius because who's going to say no to like a, a kid? Oh, that's right. Kid. It's good marketing. So it was genius. He told me I would get... I think it was like seven bucks for every pack I sold. Yeah. And like, I mean, the 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 sale for it, the pitch was like, it was almost a fail-proof pitch. Oh, it's sold every time. Pour some Diet Pepsi on the carpet, drop the towel on, soak it, rinse it out, look at all the visuals. And then people are like, yeah, I want two or three of them right then. And oh, yeah. Just sold them constantly. And then sold remember, itself. There's a live TikTok. Oh, it, <laughs> it, selling that doesn't, hasn't changed. You have to have a good hook, good pitch and all that. Like it, 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 it nailed it, nailed. But no, and then this was the last one. Is, I guess the only one that technically didn't make it to this booth was Nichelle. That's got mama there. She was probably there at one point. I don't know. Oh, no. I don't know if she no, was there. No, Nichelle didn't want nothing to do with the business. Well, no, no, she didn't. But mm -hmm. it actually worked out in our benefit, though. She went yeah. out and got a bunch of other work experience. That we use. Oh, exactly. Or coming back in when she, when she came into the business, when she wanted to come back into the business, or just actually not come back, just come This is probably when there. mama first started realizing that she was going to stay in the business. Because the reality was that she didn't want it. She wanted me just to go off and get a regular everyday job. Because running a business, you struggle. Especially when you first start. So to bring the audience in, because this is being recorded. Nichelle's our sister. And she currently works with us now. No, that was Michelle, mom. No, 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 no I'm saying just... we referenced Nichelle, but that's our oh. sister who now currently works with us and yeah. helps she, set all this up. She actually, takes care so. of all the fun background stuff. She is my daughter. She's my twin. And she's not very nice sometimes. She so does her you're, job. You're saying that you're not very nice sometimes. No, okay, just sound recording. No, no, we got strong, recording. strong headed woman is what she is, uh, which is very important. <laughs> All right, so another, another kind of big question I have. Um, was it just purely, I guess, um, support of the family or just keeping yourself in business? What, how did you develop the strength or where did the strength come from Like when we did have uh, economic downturns? Like the one I can remember is I remember 07, 08. I remember when the economy tanked out. That's when I was oh, yeah. just kind of going into being a full-time tenor. And I remember us, it, you know, business going great. And then all of a sudden it's face planting on itself. Like, and like, let alone that just happened. Wasn't that the second Gulf War? No, that was the housing crash. That was the housing market crash. 
Oh, the housing crash. As I was gone yeah, for that no. one. The Gulf War was worse. Worse? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Way worse. To you to you at that time. To everybody in the world because they were afraid to spend money because they are worried about the war. Every time you go to war, people get nervous. Well, I guess that one, there hadn't been anything really since right. Vietnam. But, I mean, we went through first the original Gulf War, then Bush... What, send everybody over to Afghanistan, Iraq, 9-11. Yeah. And they all went over there. Then we had the house crunch. So, so I remember, I remember, because I was in high school at the time, 9-11. I remember that being a pretty big downturn. And I remember that that was right about the time that the yellow page kind of ended. But I remember uh, you telling me before, because I wasn't that plugged into it, that the yellow page listings for window tint shops in Vegas from pre 911 to after 911 it went from like 100 and something shops like down to like 50 or 60 and 40 in, in one yellow page. 40 shops we had 130 something shops so there's only 40 left so it was like the internet and an economic crisis it just hit at one time killed everybody they didn't, they couldn't survive that was the biggest thing is staying alive um i think the biggest thing that hit us out of any of all those including the house crunch was the fact that um I mean, you can't see it coming, but the pandemic was like, that was a survival point for people. Because when that pandemic hit, no one's seen everybody closing up their stores and not doing business. And the thing is, it wasn't the fact that our store had to close. It was the fact that all our customers' stores had to close. So like casinos, people that actually bring us big jobs... They closed. So that was the difference. I mean, you learn all those different things as you go. So pretty much I say this. So the past experience is what, because I mean, in, in my eyes, when the pandemic first hit, technically no one knew kind of what was happening the first like two or three weeks. Right. I, I know I was definitely of a different mindset. I had a newborn at the time. Um, didn't know what to think. Didn't know what I was bringing home to him. Scared to death of that. But I will say if it wasn't for you, there's no doubt in my mind. Like we probably would have followed suit with like, oh, let's close our doors for a bit. And we might have managed to get past that. But if we would have closed our doors, getting past that, like looking back at it now, I, it, it would have been a struggle to, to either because of how much, just how much we would have lost and how much ground we would have lost. Well, the thing is, is that what really made the pandemic, which people didn't see coming, people started panicking and they were worried about people breaking into their homes and robbing them. And security film went crazy. So one good customer pretty much saved us. And that would be Nick Carter, his wife, Laura. She got us a job. We did her house. And then we did her whole neighborhood practically. Now, that one client saved, got us a lot of business. It was, it was a crazy time. I remember doing all those. I think it's Lauren. Lauren, Lauren yeah. Kipp. Um, she's an amazing person. Yeah. Um, oh, she is. She's given us a lot of work. Oh. And yeah, we ended up doing a lot of homes in that entire neighborhood. Um, Stayed in the neighborhood for but about a month and a half. How, Easily. How well we did. And, you know, initial early days, I remember like we even called the governor's office because we actually were considered essential because home security and um, even automotive services were considered essential, which our license falls under. So we still had the shop closed for retail automotive, but we had some other accounts that weren't retail. Wholesales. That, yeah, that we, that we were able in. to have the guys come in. No and, clients, and get just stuff the done. cars. Yeah. But, well, but the fact that like it turned out the way it did, looking back on it, it's actually the thing that's given me the most confidence of like, okay, we're going to be all right no matter what. Like, when the strip shut down, that was that was scary. Like it was. Vegas is going to be in trouble. And then we had a bunch of other effects that we couldn't even see coming. The amount of people that moved here from California that got to go work from home and then realized they didn't need to have the San Francisco cost of living. They could live here. Like the amount of residential commercial work we got went went way up. Way. And it was like, oh, okay. Like that was terrifying for about a month. And then it was like, oh, we're good. And we're actually busy. And then we just got busier and busier and busier. Um, yeah, I don't know. You just have to learn to roll with what's happening. The reality is, is I think the pandemic pretty much has got any business that survived it and is still in business. 
that they 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 better be pl- waiting for it. I mean, the Gulf War, we, we weren't ready for that because I was doing that California mobile tent. And every time I could buy a van and put a new logo on it, I bought it. Because that's two more guys making me, you know, 2000, 2000 a van a day I was making. So I had six of them going out at the time. So, but once that Gulf War hit, I had spent all my money on those vans. I had no reserves. And people were like not doing nothing. So it would be fair to say then, because of that experience, that I, definitely helped you push through the pandemic. Because oh. I know we were on the side of like, hey, we need to step back a bit. And you were, yes, step back, but we need to keep working. We, we need to, if they say we can stay open, we need to take every precaution we need to take. Um, to follow whatever we have to follow at the time being, come up with our new systems. Because I would say the pandemic definitely beyond us, like after the first couple of weeks, we got through it. And, you know, um, after we got through those first couple of weeks, we actually thankfully were able to adapt and kind of roll with it. But with you thankfully pushing us through that, that's when we took on, we were already kind of using tent was at the time a little bit. And then right then we made the flip to like, all right, we're just going to, we're going to go full fledged. Yeah. In, in, in ways. And the reality is it would scare anyone, but the, um, I wasn't closing my store. I worked too hard to put it open. I mean, if we had a chance to keep it open, which we did because we were essential, especially when it came to the security yeah. film. Yeah, this is a crazy term now looking yeah. back on it. But I know. It's um, not someone's business well, essential, not essential. I think all of those lessons learned over, over the years, like even going out when we were slow, like if we were slow, we just didn't sit around and like hope for the magic, like lead ferry, which I don't even think we use the word lead. Like there's something we've learned as we've gotten better at business. Um, we would go out and hustle and knock on doors or put flyers on doors Major or cards put fl- cards, cards on cars. On cars you yeah, know? that was um, huge. There's, there's always something that's in your control and what you might not have been saying it in a way of like a Jocko or some of these people now that are very articulate and can explain these ideas, but you definitely showed it to us by like, yeah. we're going to do whatever we have to do. And we're not quitting, yep. which is another thing I think that we learned by you getting us into baseball. Baseball is like a game of failure. Like, hey. like keep trying, keep right. practicing, oh, keep yeah. getting better and now that I'm older, that's I, definitely a good yeah. thing. You fail more than you succeed. Yeah, a hundred percent. Like now that I, I I compare everything to jujitsu now that I've been doing that for like the last five years, but it's like I realize now baseball is jujitsu. It's the same thing. Yeah. Like you're gonna fail a bunch, then you're gonna practice, and you're gonna learn new techniques, and you're gonna get coached, and you're gonna try again, and you're probably still gonna fail more than you succeed, but you're gonna incrementally get better. Yep. And the idea that we can apply that to business is yeah. like that's how we have survived all of these downturns. Yeah, that's like I'm not business. after. I had my stroke and I'm at home. I used to worry all the time about the shop. I, I don't even think twice about it no more. I'm not worried about it. Now, I know you guys have to worry about it, but I'm not worried at all. Not one well, bit. It makes me feel really good to hear that. Yeah, you know, so the reality is, is I, I'm done with it. I really didn't think I could survive without it, to be honest with you. But I'm cool. I put my 40 years in. I'm ready to go. <laughs> yeah, no, it, um, no, hearing that, I really do appreciate that. Like, but at the same time, you had been slowly training and molding us into the position of being able to take over and what to expect. And me might not have noticed it or I might not have understood it growing up. I understand it now. Yeah. Like, I, I understand it now. That's, that's the, that was the biggest reason for me, like, wondering, like, I don't know how you did it to begin with i really don't you like, do it uh, as a well, parent yeah but at the same time it's something i'm never going to be able to experience because i grew up in an industry and then then let alone beyond growing up in the industry we grew a business so i got to step into a business that was already kind of solidified already had a nice good base and then we got to i know uh, we're running out of time here i got one quick question one one thing to do um the reality was as i shoved you into this business as young kids and you learned, but you've both won the world championship at Window Tinny. That wasn't an accident. I can guarantee you that. The reality is, is you know, people know you guys nationwide. We, I mean, we've won three world championships at, in one store in Nevada. There is another shop in Nevada that's even placed in the world championships. So, 
That's how I know how good we are. Oh, and then I would like to correct um, some from the times that I have been lucky enough to win that things I've forgotten to say on stage, or maybe I've forgotten to say to you is the main reason I've won those channel openships is solely you. Uh, you know, I, you being as meticulous as you are and showing me that is the main thing that matters has molded me into the installer that I am. And now that I think, I think it's 80% me, me, maybe even 70, uh, and 30, your mom. You're more like your mom than you know. I, I want to add to that. He is my twin. I, 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 uh, or I, yes. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> yes. Hey, I'll take it. Um, Slow and perfectionist. I believe that it's a combination of that. And then also, we've also been very fortunate to all the other people that we've met in the industry, other employees that we've oh, had. Oh, uh, other employees are um, like family. Current employees. Yeah, definitely. Uh, family, basically. Brendan, his whole like, family. The, the journey of nonstop learning has been, has been the lesson that you Our taught company us that, logo that is it's always the heart been. of everything right now. It's why we're doing this right now. Sorry. Like, I want to... I want to share that message. Like, don't right. stop learning. Like, just because we've, you, you, you said, call this world champions and it's like, I don't, it's cool, but like, I'm better today than I was a year ago when I won that. And I'm going to like be better next yeah, year and the year on. And we're going to instill that in our company and hopefully help spread that through the industry. That's exactly. The, um, and <laughs> what I was going to tell you guys is that, um, in the industry, I watch you guys do the podcast with the um, Tint Wiz, which is a wonderful program. Um, I watch you guys go back and forth with him with the questions that you ask him. And I'm sure I see so many of those comments on that thing when those people are talking about it. And they've, we may assume that they've seen what we've done, but maybe they haven't. I mean, a young me to see a podcast like that and get all that information is priceless because I didn't go to college to get a business degree. I, I made my own business degree by just learning it while I was doing it. And this is a, a great trade for that. It's like the hard work plus the luck of the right trade at the right time has been, oh, been amazing. And absolutely. I, I don't know. I just, I hope more people realize that this industry and this trade is available to any young sure. person without having to go oh, a yeah. bunch of debt. That is probably the biggest thing that I'd say that we have changed in the company is that we stopped looking for someone who, who I mean, I, we still always put out feelers to say, if you know, if you're looking for installers, if you come in, interview them, try to vet them through the process. But unfortunately, it, it's really one of the old sayings. It's hard to teach an old dog new tricks, especially in our industry. Tenors are extremely stubborn. I'm extremely stubborn. I know he is. Like almost all the installers in the industry are kind of uh, extremely stubborn, but it's being able to Put your ego aside and then and realize new workers. Put your ego aside and realize there's always something new to learn. Like what as touching on what he just said and the fact that that's probably that is probably the best thing that you taught us growing up was to always be open to learn and keep learning and growing. Because that that by far is the biggest trait that makes me what I am right now. I remember when I used to take bug back windows out of the Volkswagens. I had three Volkswagens in my Agora store. And I took all the back windows out. Well, I didn't mark which one was which. And I got the windows mixed up from 67 to 69 and oh, marked them all. Oh, no. Well, I could put the back windows in one piece. What I would do is I just overlap the film, cut it, and then fill it in with like a black marker. And you couldn't see the seam from the outside. They loved it. But uh, the first time after that, right after I did that, that guy called me and told me that he could put a 57 Chevy in one piece. And a lot of times guys say, oh, you're crazy. Goodbye. I didn't say that. I said, come show me. I'm willing to learn. And that was probably one of the best investments I ever made was the $1,200 I paid for him to come. Absolutely. So you can always learn something new in this business, period. Uh, that you being our first teacher is one of the things that like inspired us to do this podcast. Like I want to become a better teacher. I want to be a, be a better trainer with our guys and continue to teach this trade, which is still in its infancy. Like, really, it just had started in the early 80s. Like, the 70s, it was happening, but right when you hit it was right when it kind of hit a stride and it actually mattered. Well, the but 70s was keep, liquid. Yeah, but if we can keep teaching it, 
um, and get better at teaching it and training our guys up better and taking the lessons we've learned from you and all the other great installers that we've worked with over the years, the people we meet at the tin-offs, um, at the panorama conventions, at the 3M classes we go to, uh, going on Tint Wisdom with Eric and listening to his episodes with other people he has on the industry, just like the industry can only grow and get better. People used to fight each other in the industry and try to like I look think. at the shop down the road as competition. But the pie can grow. Most people don't know home window tents and options still to this day. I have people every single week tell me, I didn't know I could do this. And it's like, oh, okay, I'm not competing with the guy down the road. I'm competing with getting the message out there that we have solutions to people's problems, whether it's heat rejection, changing the look of something, creating privacy, security. Like all of these things exist and a lot of people still don't even know it exists. We can grow the size of the industry and there aren't enough people to do it right now. So the only way we're going to do that is to train people and teach people and learn from each other. I don't know. Oh, no, the, I think the Tint Wisdom podcast that he does is probably growing more in the last whatever year or two or whatever he's been doing it uh, than, than anything else. Uh, social media is this giant. Oh, absolutely. I mean, that's how we literally got on one of our, that's how we grew our business. We had a, we had a, a kid walk in um, and was like, I have already been to two shops. And I just told him like, I've been watching um, videos online, I watching YouTube, I was watching um, Window Tent Warrior, Sean Roach. And like, I'm interested in learning. Like I just, you know, I'm a hard worker. I just wanna, I wanna learn the trade. Like I wanna get into this industry. And like, to be honest, like I, well, with most of our young hires that we've had recently, it's, I see myself kind of in them. Cause I remember being that young, hungry kid coming out of high school, wanting to make money. And it's like, yeah, I'm, as long as you have the right attitude, you want to learn. And I, I can show you the way I absolutely can show you the way that's like, that is the next thing that I want to be like, I'm not a master, at, but try to master is, is training because technically we can say that you've done that. Cause you have, yes, you have, you have, both of us have been thankfully been able to win the 10 off. I won it twice. He took first and then he took second to me uh, one year. And it's probably going to happen this year too, but we'll see what happens. The you're only just, person you're just, you're just well, lucky. Well, yeah. <laughs> you're just lucky your dad can't come. <laughs> oh yeah, I've heard that. Over <laughs> uh, okay, whatever. <laughs> but beyond beyond that, the next next goal of mine is I want to have an installer that I know that I trained or to we win. trained. That would be good. Company trained. Maybe Luca, because like that's just like okay, like I know I've I've, I've gotten as close to mastering my craft as I possibly can, even though I'm still learning. That's why I go to the ten offs. I love going to ten offs. It makes me a better installer. I'll see someone install something. And I'm like, after they get done, I'm like, why'd you do that? I mean, that's how I got into the paint protection finals was I was literally talking to Nick from Fusion Tools and he was like, do you use hot water? I'm like, what are you talking about? And he explained the process of clearing out the edge with hot water and rolling the edge. And I was like, okay. Went back up to my room, filled the bottle with hot water, competed, did my fender, made it to the finals. And yeah. like, like I, I was about to stop doing PPF because I just thought like I was wasting my time a little bit. But, you know, I was like, you know, I'm going to try it one more time. I tried it and gotten into it. So it, it, it's definitely the main reason why I love going to things is the training aspect. But that is definitely my next goal is like, I want to know the feeling like you now have experience, like to have someone that you trained go and win. Something well, like, like you guys said, I know you guys are was pushing towards the school. Having the school would be awesome. But it's the fact that having someone to teach it, it will take a lot of time. Oh, Yes. We've definitely come to realize that and learn that. But it's very rewarding when you take someone who's known nothing, which over the past three years, that's what we've done with our installers. That's how we've been hiring is taking people that want to come to work are going to show up on time to hit those traits because those are the hard ones to find. And then we've gotten now where we have uh, a full four-man crew now in auto. Uh, we have now we just hired someone else. We have a six-man crew in flat glass now with trainees going constantly to where it's like, it's, we have a nice, really good flow going to find out if they, if they got what they have, they, they have what it takes. And then if they do, we continue the training. All right. I really enjoyed doing this with you guys. Um, the reality is, is if you're not out there educating other people in this industry, then they won't know what it takes to make it in it. And getting all the education through something like this will save you months and years of time. The, the education that we gave you because we've been doing this for 40 years. There isn't a job you can't tell us that we haven't done. We've done them all from big giant buildings to houses to fleets of 
hundreds of cars. So I enjoyed doing it. I just wanted to thank you for coming on, being um, being our first guest, um, taking us on this journey. Um, you know, I, I can't tell you how much or how grateful I am with everything that you have taught me um, from being a, a, a worker, business owner, and then father and, and all that. I, the, the life lessons are, they, they, they still haven't stopped and still like having this conversation and how you looked at certain aspects. Like it's, it's, it, it, it's awesome. Th thank you. I really do appreciate it. Well, I got to thank you first. Yeah. You <laughs> I follow up on everything he just said, but um, thanks for tuning in to Born to Tent. Um, since this is the first time and we haven't really explained the name, let's do that real quick. So we came up with the name Born to Tent with the Miller Brothers because we were literally born into this industry. Um, and we didn't talk about it all on this podcast, but we will in the future. We're both training for a 100-mile ultramarathon right now, which the book that inspired us to get into that, that's a longer story for another conversation, was Born to Run. Uh, we live in Nevada now, the Battleborn State, and we were born into the window tent industry. So that's kind of where the name came from. And we'd really like to thank you for, for tuning in and listening to this. Hopefully you learned something. That's the whole point. Uh, our community thrives on engagement. So if you could click the subscribe button, that would be awesome. We'd really appreciate it. Um, we hope to have more great guests from the industry and outside of the industry, possibly clients of ours and community members. But we're, we're definitely going to focus on having some top names on the industry on. Um, and it was only fitting to have our father have us on as our first teacher in what is now our, we're now taking on a role as teachers ourselves um, and trying to share the knowledge that we learned from him.